Today it is time for something new, something that I have not done before on the YouTube channel and I'm really excited for it because today we're gonna have a look at two replays submitted to me by a viewer. Now rather than casting the games however, I'm gonna try and help out Idle Time directly and help him become a better Zerg player. He is currently right around Diamond 3 slash Platinum 1, so definitely a little bit higher up on the ladder. But if you're anywhere between like, you know, Silver League and Master League, I should be able to help you out directly through this video as well. It's going to be specifically about the Zerg vs. Protoss matchup. And without further ado, I think it is time to unpause this replay, jump into it and watch the matches entirely from Idle Time's point of view. Now, Idle Time is indeed going to be one of the Patreon supporters. As some of you may be aware, I recently added several new Patreon perks to patreon.com slash locotv. I'll leave a link to that page down below in the description of this video as well, because maybe you would like me to have a look at your matches directly as well, and hopefully help you out that way too. However, of course, there are, you know, countless other perks as well. So have a look at the Patreon page, even if you are not necessarily interested in the replay analysis. But without further ado, let's talk about the games here instead. So... Idle Time, like I said, is definitely a little bit higher up on the ladder, and he is struggling a little bit in the Zerg vs. Protoss matchup. Now, I already had a look at both of the games, and I gotta say, I'm actually really quite impressed with the way that he is handling many of the early game situations in particular. I feel like he's doing some very great moves, um, you know, that make him look almost like a Master League player, and you'll be able to see that in this match as well. However, there are a couple of things that he is not quite prioritizing nearly as much that's sort of preventing his advancement on the ladder. So, you'll be able to figure out exactly what I mean here in just a second. Now, my throat does sound a little bit funny, as you may have already noticed. I got a bit of a cold, so I got myself some tea. Otherwise, my uh, my voice is probably going to give out. Now, I asked Idle Time to go ahead and submit two replays to me um, of matches where he felt like he played very, very solid, but he still ended up losing the games. Now, in my experience, I found that most players lose, you know, the game by about the 8-minute mark or so. Essentially, like, the first 8 minutes are going to be the most important minutes of the game. Because usually, up until, like, Master League or so, what happens after 8 minutes is not nearly as important. It's really the first couple of minutes of the match that usually end up deciding the outcome. Now, of course, there are matches where uh, that is not going to be quite the case. But in the vast majority of the games, um, you know, the first 8 minutes is going to be the crucial couple of minutes where I feel like most mistakes are in indeed made. Now, early game, of course, idle time should be able to execute the uh, the strategies quite well. Zerg vs. Protoss, uh, in its very nature, is very similar to the Zerg vs. Terran matchup too, where it's mostly like the Protoss player that will try and prevent the Zerg player um, from really getting all too much economy out, and they'll try and slow you down as much as they possibly can. All right, so first interesting thing to note is that we saw a quick hatch gas pull. He um, pulled the drones out of gas, however, at 100, and he started up the metabolic boost upgrade. There's a couple of things you could try and do if you are a Zerg player. For example, uh, if you figure out exactly where it is your opponent spawned in the earlier part of the game, um, you may be able to pull the drones out of gas and skip out the Nomatized Carapace, so the Overlord Speed Upgrade. But if you are somewhere in Diamond League, I definitely would consider, um, if I were you, to leave the drones in gas just a little while longer and get the Nomatized Carapace Upgrade just a bit early on, just because it's going to make him, uh, you know, gain a lot more potential scouting information at this point in the game. Now, if you are anywhere below like Diamond League, I don't think that is going to be as crucial, but it's definitely a, uh, a point of consideration. You want to try and, you know, get as much intel on your opponent as you possibly can, because there's a lot of nasty Protoss builds in particular that can easily throw you off guard. Think of, for example, Archon Drops, uh, Quick Dark Templar play, but more importantly, of course, Oracle Aras, Triple Stargate Aras. There's like all kinds of different aggression that a Protoss player can go for, and by scouting with Nomatized Carapace and Overlord Speed, you usually have a, uh, a pretty good chance at catching it early on. Gotta compliment uh, the Zerklings, actually, in the earlier part of the game. He's just about to finish up Zerkling speed, and that's the moment where he sends the Zerklings across. This is a very important thing to do, because if you send them out a little bit earlier, a couple of Adepts may just accidentally pick them off, and that's gonna cut into your dro drone production in the earlier part of the game. Also, Queen Control so far has been very solid, and I do like the fact that Idle Time went for a very quick third base, on top of all of the scouting information that he's gathering right here inside of that main. So he did end up seeing right here that it is going to be a robotics facility. So in this game in particular, it may not be necessary to go for the Nomatized Carapace. But regardless, I would recommend at the very least making that consideration. But so far, earlier part of the game is definitely looking very, very solid. I don't think there's much room for improvement right here in the first couple of min minutes of the game. Other than maybe the gas spending that I, you know, briefly talked upon or touched upon just a second ago. 
Now, this is where the game becomes quite a bit more interesting, right? Because you should be able to pull off something along these lines right here in the vast majority of the games that you play on the ladder. Now, how is he going to respond to the early bits of aggression that the Protoss player will be able to throw at him? Gotta say, I like the uh, the diva announcer. I think that's a diva announcer right here that he uses. <laughs> you hear the nice squeaky voice every now and then from diva, explaining to him that he needs to do a couple of things here and there. But regardless, really aggressive droning here, and this is super crucial, right? Zerk versus Protoss. I mean, it's essentially a race to 70 workers. Which race can get up to 70 workers first without really taking critical damage is very important. So right there, he moves up the ramp and he sees up a he sees a couple of things, right? So this is something that is maybe a little bit uh, a little bit confusing. He sees the Chrono Boost on a gateway. Don't really know exactly why the Chrono Boost is there, but he also sees the Chrono Boost on the Cybernetics Core. And this already is an important scout. If you are indeed playing a little bit higher up on the ladder, uh, seeing that a Cyber Core is getting Chrono Boosted is usually an indication that they're trying to get their Warp Gates out as soon as they possibly can. And Zerg versus Protoss, it's very much so uh, about finding that balance between having enough workers and not over droning. You want to try and get as many workers as you can without dying. So. Seeing a Chrono Boost at Cybernetics Core should immediately, you know, at the very least ring a little bit of a bell in your head that you could potentially, um, you know, have to deal with some early game pressure from your opponent just with a bunch of gateway units, right? And on top of that, of course, we already saw that robotics facility here as well. Now, there is a note that I want to make right here that I would recommend everyone to do if you are below Master League. Even though you may scout precisely what it is your opponent is doing, because the 4 minute mark is usually a very important point. There's a couple of things that Protoss players can do that are very annoying. Most notably, Dark Templar as well as early game Oracle Harass. And, you know, of course, the Dark Templar can be morphed into Archons as well. And I would say that Archon Drops and Oracle Harass are probably the case in about you know, 50 to 75% or so of all of the matches that you play, depending on the league that you're currently in. Now, the one way you can deal with both of those early game pressures is by making one blind spore crawler in every mineral line at the four minute mark. Now, of course, at the pro level, you don't see players do this because it's a rather big investment, right? It's about 75 minerals for a spore crawler plus the cost of a drone as well. But if you are anywhere below Master League, and I do this all the time in my own games as well, and I'm currently playing right around 5.4k MMR, pretty high up on the ladder. Um, make a spore crawler in every mineral line at the four minute mark. There's almost no reason to skip this out unless you are Master League and, and maybe even Grand Master League. I would recommend doing this until at least 5,000 MMR. It just simply simplifies the strategy so much because not only do you have to worry as much about scouting, you're essentially blind countering like half of the early game pressure that a Protoss player is going for, right? So uh, once again, recommendation is to go ahead and put down a spore crawler in every mineral line at the four minute mark. Now so far, we're talking about quite a couple of minor details like for example the gas expenditure as well as um you know of course the the spore crawler timing right there but the reason why we're doing so is because the early game from idle time is looking very solid he's doing a good job at spending his money and he's also making sure that he's got a heck of a lot of workers and workers are the most important part at this point in the game However, at this point, the game does go south a little. So, so far, I would say 420, apparently, uh, until the 4 minutes and 20 second mark, and that's, you know, I guess a little pun right there, but regardless, uh, Idle Time has been playing this very solidly. However, from here on out, the game starts to crumble a little bit, and things start going out of control. And I feel like for Idle Time, it's not necessarily the fact that he is incapable of executing strategies, and he's also not, you know, playing too slow, or he's not, like, you know, playing it very sloppily. However, he is not quite prioritizing the things that he should be focusing on primarily. And this is a very common thing uh, for players in particular in Platinum League or so, um, because it, it, really, it really holds you back from advancing on the ladder. He's doing a couple of things very well. First off, let me just compliment the fact that he's doing an insane job with the creep spread and he's gonna do so for the entirety of the match his creep spread is looking like he is somewhere you know in master league his, his creep spread is very good in both of the games that we're gonna be watching today his strategy and his build order timing is actually looking very solid as well maybe i would have liked to see some drones a little bit faster but you know that's mostly just me nitpicking uh he's getting supply blocked every now and then once again it's me nitpicking it's to be expected at this point in the game however the one thing that he is very much so slipping on is the larva production so as you may have already noticed, with the melee upgrade going down, it's a massive indication that Idle Time is planning on playing a Zerkling Baneling based composition. And while Zerkling Baneling is very cheap when it comes to the, you know, cost of the actual unit, of course the Zerklings are only, you know, they come out in pairs of two and they're only 50 minerals for two, um, they are a very expensive unit when it comes to larva. And I would always recommend 
that you take larva as a resource into account as well in StarCraft 2. So while Zerklings and Banelings are cheap when it comes to their mineral and gas production, um, they are very expensive when it comes to the amount of larva that they cost. And at this point in the game, you can see that idle time is really wrecking up the amount of resources that he's got. He's already up to about 2,000 resources. Well, you know, by the six minute mark or so, he's already up to about 2,000 resources just by playing a strong, straightforward early game. Once again, he's doing a great job at scouting. He's figured out exactly what it is the Protoss player is going for. And while he didn't quite go for the Spore Crawlers, I feel like in this game it's okay because he scouted the super early Robo and then also the Twilight Council. So the chances of his opponent going for, you know, something that requires Spores or is going to be rather slim. However, you can see here that he had the minerals to go ahead and, you know, make some Spores anyway. It doesn't really matter all too much. Now, here's what we run into. While the creep spread is out of control, the build order is looking solid and everything is else is looking nice as well. Idle Time has done such a good job at making workers, he's already up to 50 workers at this point in the game, that he does not quite have the, um, the Larva here available to properly spend all of the resources that he's got. So let's go ahead and speed up the game just a little bit. The Protoss player is going to make a move across the map right now. You see that he will be capable of producing quite a handful of uh, quite a handful of Zerklings here. He's trying to add on Banelings here as well. But because of the you know crazy amount of workers that he made early on, which once again is absolutely crucial for playing the Zerk versus Protoss at a higher matchup, he does not quite have the Larva available to pull off a proper production here of an army. So look at this, right? 2,000 resources right now and there's a push coming in from the Protoss. Now, even though, of course, he's also going up against the Protoss that's not going to be at the very highest level of the ladder either, if you imagine that the Protoss would have spent all of these resources here too, which you can expect if you are going up against people in Diamond League, you would have absolutely gotten stomped right here. Right? Now, the game is indeed going to go on for about another 9 minutes or so, but he would have gotten absolutely stomped right here just because of the sheer amount of stuff that the Protoss player would have been able to produce. There's no observer here. Protoss did not quite clean up any of the, uh, you know, any of the creep here. He did not, you know, get enough gateways to properly support this. Uh, only just now are gateways being added on. So you can see that Ori right here in this game is losing a couple of potential uh, units in the earlier part of the game just because of his lack of macro, right? But imagine that your Protoss opponent was playing perfect. This would be the moment that idle time would have lost the game, which is why I always recommend that the first eight minutes of your game should be spot on, because usually that's where the first big engagement would have happened. So what could idle time have done at this point in the game to prevent him from losing right here? So once again, creep spread is good. Drone timings have been good. However, he has not quite produced enough larva to properly support an army composition based around Zerkling Bailing Hydra, which once again is the absolute gold standard right now at the professional level of StarCraft 2. There's a couple of things. First off, his first option is to go ahead and produce more larva, right? Getting more larva is done in two different ways. So either he would be absolutely on top of his queen injects, which is what my main, uh, you know, critique of this game is. He has to be absolutely on top of his queen injects, right? You can see that the queens already have accumulated quite a bit of energy here and there. It may not seem very significant, but it is indeed going to cut, you know, the amount of drones that you can indeed, or the amount of Zerg control that you can produce at this point in the game very significantly. Or what he could have done as well is simply produce more and more hatcheries. And this is something that I feel like a lot of players are not very comfortable with or they're not really liking that concept nearly as much because at the pro level of StarCraft 2, once again, you don't see pro gamers getting nearly as many macro hatcheries as is usually advised at lower level of play because they hit every single queen inject. But if you know that you are slipping up in macro, to simply accumulate, uh, you know, larva on a hatchery instead. It's the smart choice to make. So what I would advise to do first off for idle time, right? is to prioritize his larva production as much as possible while still trying to be on top of all of the drones that he can make as well. So produce as much larva as you possibly can. When you think about all of the things that you need to do as a Zerg player, for example, creep spread, microing your army, doing scouting information, uh, you know, getting your build order done, generating, you know, larva as well. I would say that generating larva and with that queen injects is at the very top of all of the priorities that you have as a Zerg player. Everything else is going to be less important than that. So what I mean with that is that while the creep spread right here is incredible, and I would recommend, you know, you try to keep that up, creep spread is, is irrelevant if you don't actually spend all of your resources. So what I'm basically trying to say is that if you ever have, you know, queen injects to do in the game, and you're currently spreading creep, 
you're essentially making a slight mistake right there because you need to try and hit your queen injects first. And I'm really hammering this point down because I feel like Idle Time is doing a great job in the early game, producing all of the drones. However, as soon as he reaches the designated amount of workers that he's looking for, he starts slipping up in the amount of uh, production that he's capable of actually pushing out just because he doesn't have the larva. So first options are to go ahead and focus really heavily on queen injects, which is what I would recommend. And the second option is to go ahead and put down macro hatcheries whenever he needs to. So say, for example, whenever he hits 1,000 minerals, go ahead and put down a macro hatchery. Whenever you hit 1,000 minerals once again, go ahead and put down a macro hatchery. And just simply what I mean with a macro hatchery, by the way, is a base inside of your base. So a hatchery, say, right over here or a hatchery right over here, or a hatchery right over here. It's fine to have like five hatcheries on three bases if you are at the, you know, below like Master League or so. It's totally fine because no one is expecting you to hit everything absolutely perfectly. It's basically just you admitting that, you know, you may not be the perfect player, but you're still trying to make the most of the situation. And over time, the more comfortable you become playing the macro game, uh, the easier it will become as well to spend all of those resources consistently. So that's my first recommendation, right? Trying to generate more larva. Another option as well, which I think is perfectly viable, once again, up to a certain level, and definitely up to, like, Master League and above, um, is to just simply go ahead and play a Roach-based army as well. I mean, when you think about it, Zerklings are cheap when it comes to minerals, so are Banelings, uh, but they are very expensive when it comes to the amount of, you know, larva that you need. So say, for example, if this Hydra Den was done earlier, right? Or say, for example, that there was a Roach Warren already down. Imagine if Idle Time would have been able to spend all of his money right here on, you know, max out Hydras or, you know, he would just be able to spend it all on Hydra Zerklings or on Roach's Hydra or Roach Zerkling or anything along those lines. If he would have been able to spend all of this, crush that army, he would be able to go for a counterattack and win the game right here, right now. So think about the game a little bit more in, um, you know, prioritization rather than just trying to, you know, deal with all of the things at once. When you think about StarCraft 2, it's oftentimes a, a game of crisis management, right? You're trying the very best, or you're trying your very best to do everything at once. And there's definitely um, a bunch of different mini games going on, like for example, the creep spread mini game and the you know unit production mini game and the queen inject mini game. When you think about all of those things that you need to do, put the queen injects and the larva production at the very top, drone production as the second, and then the third one would be spending your resources. So once again, queen injects at the very top. Making as many drones as you possibly can, so that includes scouting information right there as well, and then spending your resources. Prioritize that, and after you've done all of that, focus once again on the creep spread. And I feel like if you do something along those lines, you're gonna be in a much better spot. Now this game is indeed gonna go on for quite a bit longer. Idle Time does, uh, you know, manage to defend that push, and he's once again gonna continue that, uh, you know, that crazy, crazy, uh, you know, that crazy, crazy creep spread. I mean, the creep spread is everywhere. Gotta say, I really like that. Solid fort base timing there as well, making good use of the Zerklings that he's got. And he's really doing a great job at controlling his opponent that way. But still, he's got too many resources to really justify this. And now the Protoss is just going to keep on moving across the map here uh, with a bigger and bigger army. It's very hard to stop the Protoss from actually getting, you know, from a maxed out state where you're going to be capable of just simply overwhelming them. Alrighty, game number two. This time around, we are on Ascension to IRLE. Once again, I'm going to primarily look at the first eight or so minutes of the game, and we're going to cruise through the earlier part of it on the times four speed, just because I, I highly doubt that Idle Time is going to make any critical mistakes at this point. Now, he did indeed see an early game probe right there doing some scouting as well, so he's going to go ahead and send the drone in as well, just to make sure that he is not getting cheesed. I guess he just got kind of rushed right before this one. But regardless, this time around in this game, we see Idle Time do a significantly better job at generating larva, right? So he's perfectly capable of doing it, it's just simply a matter of prioritization. He's doing a couple of things very well. I once again really like the fact that he's getting a ton of drones in the earlier game. He's doing a good job at scouting. Really got to compliment his Zerkling control as well. But once again, we're talking about the prioritization right here. If you're, you know, prioritizing the critical parts of the game, oftentimes you're going to become uh, a significantly better player towards the, you know, mid to late game as well, as that is the point where, you know, you see a lot of the matches go once you hit Master League or so. So while other time plays it pretty much perfectly, you know, the first four minutes or so of the game, once again, this is the point where we can start room for improvement. So remember, right, once again, we're at the 4 minute and 20 second mark. And when you think about all of the options that Protoss has right now, once again, this is the moment where Protoss could have won the game, okay? And let me try and tell you how. Since Idle Time has got no information whatsoever about the Protoss main base, 
there's a good chance that there would, for example, be a Stargate hidden right there. Now, the very first Oracle will hit your side of the map right around the four and a half minute mark, okay? Dark Templar, almost the same thing. So about four and a half minutes is when you should be expecting those units from making their way across the map. If you start up Spore Crawlers right around the four minute mark, so, you know, really want to precisely aim for four minutes, because uh, that way they will indeed finish up in time. Um, if you would make those, he would be safe against those, you know, two different kinds of pressures at this point in the game. But there's nothing, right? Imagine right now one Oracle coming in, it would be able to kill at least 10 workers, and then the follow-up Oracle would probably also be able to get at least 5 or so. So that's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. If there were a Dark Templar out on the map, even though he's seen that third base at this point in the game, um, there's still, you know, definitely a chance that the opponent is going for Dark Templar. If there were Dark Templar out at this point in the game, um, to get away at that third base, there's absolutely nothing that Idle Time would have been able to do. So I really want to emphasize once again that four minutes pork crawler because it makes the game significantly easier and it makes it lots easier to defend against all different kinds of early game protos pressure. And once again, that does not, you know, allow you to not do any scouting anymore. It's still very helpful to scout against, for example, Oracle pressure. But really, things are looking pretty solid. Another thing that I do want to uh, touch upon right here is the fact that um, in this game, Idle Time does it a little bit differently than in the previous one. He gets a lot of Zerklings. These are 28 Zerklings right here, right? And you got to keep in mind, 28 Zerklings is essentially the same as about 14 drones, right? At this point in the game, all of these Zerklings could have been drones if you wanted to. Now, I do like the idea of having a couple of Zerklings out just in case you have to morph them into Bane Links or just in case a couple of Adepts pop their head out into your natural lines um, or mineral lines rather, but... You know, it's it's very hard to justify 28 Zerklings at this point in the game, in particular when the third base is already up and running, right? If you know for a fact that there's going to be a Mothership core there, good luck trying to do any damage whatsoever. So, um, I, I like the fact that there are a couple of Zerklings out, but I would have much rather, you know, seen about eight or so of them. Also, when you feel like Protoss is taking a very greedy third base, um, oftentimes the gut instinct is to try and do some pressure there, which makes a lot of sense in a way, but a good Protoss, when you think about it, they're not going to allow you to do any damage whatsoever. So these Zerglings right here get stopped. The one over here also absolutely gets shut down, and, you know, one worker right here was killed in total, and I don't even know if it was killed right over here, right? So this is a rather big loss as well. Instead, whenever you see your opponent get very greedy in the earlier part of the game, get a handful of Zerklings out that you might potentially want to morph into Bane Links, uh, but just simply drawn up straight to like 70, 80 workers instead. It's usually a much safer option uh, that is not gonna, you know, involve your opponent making a mistake, and instead is gonna emphasize your own strengths as well. Um, so that's just a, a minor little sidestep right there. So right now we do see Spore Crawlers go down, but once again, right, Oracles and Dark Templar would have, oops, uh, they, they would have absolutely murdered all of this already. Now, when it comes to the Zerg versus Proto matchup, ideally, right, and you can always mouse over the top right corner uh, in the game, right? You can always do this in-game. Right now, it doesn't work because I'm in a replay, but if you mouse over the top right corner in the game, you can see the amount of workers that you've got. And ideally, before you start making any kind of big amounts of army, you're looking to have about 70 drones out or so, okay? So 70 drones would include about four hatcheries uh, that are placed at bases and then one or two additional macro hatcheries as well. That's the gold standard. Um, so 70 workers, that's what you're looking for, right? At this point in the game, Partly due to the fact that these Zerklings earlier on did absolutely nothing, we are actually quite far behind to here, uh, right now, right? So it's 55 versus 72 workers. That is the moment where Protoss is going to be very happy. So once again, 8-minute uh, mark, this should be a pretty straightforward loss from here on out, just because of decisions made in the earlier part of the game. So it's rather... You know, it sounds maybe rather depressing for me to say it, and I definitely don't recommend you GG out at this point in the game, but if you assume that your opponent is playing it really well as well, which is what I personally always really like to do, it's going to be a very tough feat to come back from here on out. Now, besides the obvious fact that, once again, overlords are a little bit scarce here and there, this time around, larva production has been significantly better. Look at that, right? Larva production all of a sudden is looking solid. Queen's not really flooding any energy whatsoever. And voila, look at that. The drones indeed are accumulating a lot of resources, but this time around, we are capable of spending them. Once again, though, you do want to try and aim for about 70 workers before making a move out across the map. And I do, once again, really like this setup here. You're going for the bailing run by, going for the, you know, amount of kills that you uh, that you want to get as a, as a Zerg player, right? Trying to pressure several different bases all at once. So here we go. A ton of workers end up falling there. Absolutely brilliantly done. Hydra's moving into the natural. I don't know if I like this one nearly as much as the first move, but regardless, he's trying to do uh, a lot of cool moves that allow him to kill a lot of stuff. But in the end, even though he killed a lot of workers here, that 
was not quite justifiable, I don't think, because it allows you, uh, or it just simply puts him so far behind against, you know, this massive Protoss ball. Now, I do think that this would have been a lot more, you know, safe and stable if you were to have, for example, 80 workers. If you got anywhere between, like, 75 to 85 or so, you know, drones out as Zerg, you can easily remake that force. Instead of you're stuck on about 60, it's very hard to throw away units and quickly replace them. So that's another, you know, minor little moment that I wanted to point out right here as well, as you may have already expected. Protoss is going to make a bit of a move across the map. There are going to be a bunch of Zerg units out. And while Idle Time did a great job dealing the damage, just simply the early game economy did not quite allow him to deal with all of this stuff. So think about all of the things that you need to do as a Zerg player, right? Prioritize them accordingly, with at the very top, the Queen Injects and the Larva generation. Then secondly, the drone production as well. Aim for about 70 before you want to really start making any kind of, you know, army, ideally, right? Obviously, if your opponent is skipping out the third base and, you know, he's going for hyper-aggressive play, definitely don't be making drones. Uh, but you're aiming for about 70 workers when your opponent is playing passive as well before you start making big amounts of army. And uh, last but not least, make sure that you keep your income, your minerals, and your gas as low as possible. Don't keep your income as low as possible. Hold up, let me reiterate that one right there. But make sure that the income that you get is going to be spent as soon as possible, because that minerals is absolutely pointless. Once again, imagine if Letney right here, the opponent of Idle Time, would have had spent these two and a half thousand minerals as well right here, right? On like four more Archons and like ten more Zealots. There's absolutely not a way that Idle Time would have been able to stop that. So a couple of minor little things. I think that Idle Time is definitely on the right track. He's playing this very, you know, smartly, doing great jobs right here with the run buys, killing tons of workers. I mean, how many did he kill this game? 33. Very well done. Creep spread is off the charge. If I was just looking at the creep spread right here and the amount of workers that he was capable of killing, I would say that he's probably in Master League. But there's a couple of things holding him back from progressing onwards. And I'm thinking that, you know, this video right here, as well as, you know, just me simply helping him out directly through the Patreon support, uh, is, uh, is, is definitely going to help him become a stronger player over the course of the next couple of months. Now, of course, it does require, uh, you know, you to practice quite a bit. So, you know, if you are looking to improve in StarCraft 2, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm always advising to try and play anywhere between like 10 to 20 games or so a day if you can. But, you know, consistent improvement is what it's all about. Try and aim for the long term. Don't try and necessarily become the best player in the short term. Because you probably are going to get frustrated. Aim for the long term. Aim for, you know, what you want to you know, what level you want to be at in, say, like, three, four months from now, rather than what you want to be next week. Because if your goal is to become Masters next week, it's going to be really hard. Whereas if you want to become, you know, Masters in, say, four months, I think that's most definitely doable. But you got to make sure that you continuously improve. Anyway, once again, if you are interested in the replay analysis yourself as well, of course, I'm only uploading these videos if you actually like me to. I'm never going to, like, upload them if you actually... You know, if, if you are submitting replays to me and you don't want me to upload uh, them directly to YouTube, of course, I'm not going to. But regardless, have a look down below uh, at my Patreon page. It's going to be patreon.com slash locotv. But for now, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile, all right? And I will see you in the next one.